Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Established in 2017, Goodman's creates sustainable investment solutions for advice professionals and retail customers, focusing on tools that help customers engage with sustainable and responsible investing. The goal is to play a key role in redirecting capital to environmentally sustainable, socially responsible, and ethical business. The Goodman's Advisor Portal is a discovery, analytics, research, and advice support tool designed to give advisors the confidence to determine their clients' responsible investment needs, analyze portfolio holdings, and access institutional-grade environmental, social, and governance research for over 7,000 global equities, ETFs, and funds. G'day, g'day. Clayton here from XY, um, chatting with Simon. Now, it's kind of interesting as a part of this five-part ethical series, uh, everyone keeps telling me to speak to you and your association. So uh, I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, I guess before we get started into, you know, everything that is uh, ethical investment, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You know, what, where, where's your back, background from and how did you end up here? Sure. Uh, I'm pleased to be here and I'm pleased that they're talking about our organisation. That means we're doing something right, hopefully, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I, um, I kind of ended up in this field as I, I hit university studying economics, right? And I was sort of doing economics going, why am I doing economics? I'm not really sure why I do economics. Uh, but I, I had a real passion for the environment. And funnily enough, about 20 years ago, I found myself on this 48-hour bus trip up to Kakadu National Park. And I was there with a bunch of university students. And we were going to join a blockade at a proposed uranium mine in Kakadu oh, National wow. Park. Oh, wow. Would, would, would I know the name of it? Yeah, it was the Jabaluka mine. And it was quite a big campaign at the time. And there were thousands of people went up there. And basically, in my mind, it was just all wrong on so many levels. You know, it was going against the traditional owner's wishes. Mm. It was in the middle of this World Heritage National Park mm. and it was uranium that was, you know, really dangerous. And I thought, why the hell are companies making these decisions to be, to be investing against the wishes of Indigenous groups? And, and I, I, I'm left there thinking, well, it's really great to protest. It felt really empowering. But then again, it felt like not many people could really hear us because we we're out in the middle of nowhere yelling out chants and stuff, which was fun. <laughs> but um, I kind of came back going, well, I really am going to have to understand how it is that decisions are made in the corporate sphere that can lead to what I consider to be really unjust um, outcomes. And so I kind of went back to economics going, okay, I actually need to figure this out. I need to study finance. I need to understand, uh, understand economics. And so I kind of committed then to go back and really understand that and try to weave together sustainability and environment and economics into a, a job that might one day pay me something, which was, which was good. And so I spent a few years doing a job that didn't pay me much at all, but <laughs> exploring some really interesting areas. And that's kind of where I found myself today in an area where I'm kind of working with the finance sector yeah. and helping the finance sector to understand how these sustainability issues can impact on portfolios and economics and outcomes from both a very material financial kind of investment returns perspective, but equally from a kind of environmental sustainability perspective as well. So, um, so now I work with the finance sector across superannuation funds, banks, fund managers, financial advisors, wow. a huge cohort of them who manage outrageous sums of money really like our members combined manage something like nine trillion dollars of assets globally and i'm working with them to understand how should they think about sustainability issues environmental issues human rights issues etc yeah. and, and i need to be able to talk about that both in a how does this impact your investments from an outcomes perspective but also how should we be considering our role uh, our really significant responsibility by directing that capital across the market and across the economy, because what we know is the way that money is invested and who's it lent to or not lent to is, is shaping the world we live in today. So there are decisions being made every day that will determine the shape of our future and yeah. our client's future and our children's future, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's really about trying to help the finance sector to understand that from both their sort of financial obligations perspective and their broader moral responsibilities perspective. Yeah, the thing that I find really interesting about 
um, ethical investments is, I guess the, I guess the tilt would be towards a, a, a more focused attitude of people in general towards um, sustainability. I, th- I think that's, that's one. And then you're always going to have, you know, you, the, the sort of extremists that, you know, don't want to eat anything that's basically ha- ever lived or, you know, on, on one end and on the other extremists would be the people that just, you know, go out of their way to annoy the vegans or whatever, you know, you got, yeah. you, you've got, you've got a, you've got a whole spectrum and then you could probably cut those people out because those people are going to make decisions, you know, because they want to, and they're very focused on that. Yeah. But you've kind of got this huge uh, sort of in a standard deviation sort of idea yeah. of in between those people that are motivated to do something and specifically motivated not to do something. And there's a huge area there where people would probably do something if it doesn't cost them any time, effort or money. Yeah. And like, I guess in, in one way you could call that sort of lazy activism, but I mean, ultimately in order for the world to change in any capacity, you need to make things really easy. And so some of the conversations that I've been having so far in this series, it's almost like, you know, how do you even broach the subject? Cause as an advisor, you don't want to overcomplicate some, someone's financial life and their goals and their aspirations, but perhaps you can ask them in their day to day life. Is there anything that they buy or avoid on a day to day basis due to any kind of uh, sustainability practice or or, or, you know, and you can kind of ask how interested they are in a way that doesn't really end up with a finger pointed at them as you're a good person, you're a bad person, you're an apathetic person, you're an activist. Like how do, because the, the conversation is around the individual, the client, you don't actually want to take the conversation down a path where you're focusing on this, especially because the majority of people are going to fit in this uh, sort of laissez-faire way of trying to improve the world. However, I feel like if advisors kind of nail that conversation, so it's their job to, to open up the channel of conversation in a comfortable way, then the way that advisors collectively, as you said, you know, the seven or $9 trillion, what you mentioned before funds under management, there's a, there's a huge ability to affect the world with, call it lazy activism. So if you, if, if advisors get, you know, the ability to um, ask these questions that don't disturb from the goals of the client, get a certain portion, let's call it 30% of people to say, you know what? Like I would prefer it if um, I wasn't investing in cigarette companies, for example, then all of a sudden, what? 30% of funds under management get stripped out of these companies. They suddenly collapse and the whole world goes, Oh damn. Like, I mean, I guess that would be the perfect uh, outcome for, for ethical investments. But I think the crazy part is there's a chance that it could happen. It just depends on how well an advisor can introduce the topic without distracting the client. Yeah, and without opening a whole can of worms that then we don't know how to respond to. And so I think I think of it this way, right? So um, there are very few clients out there or people in Australia who would say, hey, I really want to get exposure to cluster munitions, landmines, maybe some of those, you know, rocket launching devices. And by the way, I love tobacco and I especially love, you know, companies that use child labour. You know, yeah. so, so what we what we can what we can say very quickly is that the vast majority of Australians just expect that their money is invested in a way that does no harm over these most mm. sort of egregious, most harmful yeah. industries and activities. And the research confirms that you know ninety percent of Australians would say, yeah, don't don't get me in any of that yeah. stuff. You know, so I think that's that's one we just should assume is the base expectation of all of our clients. Yeah. And I think there's a big risk in not assuming that because then one day your client will look at their portfolio and say, 
what the hell is, you know, XYZ company doing in there? I didn't know I had exposure to Halliburton and tobacco, Halliburton. Yeah, ex- exactly. And they yeah. may just say, well, yeah, like what? So I think there's a big risk of not just assuming from a starting point that all of your clients, at least the vast majority, have some expectations. Um, and, and this is kind of what has driven over the last five years um, most of Australia's major super funds to divest of tobacco across their whole funds. And this has not been just for their SRI or ethical fund options. They've just said, you know what? Actually, we kind of get that most of our members pretty much, you know, without, without debate would not want to be investing in tobacco. So you've basically seen most of the super funds of Australia dump tobacco stocks Funnily enough, most of them don't make a public announcement when they do that because they're concerned that their members will say, you're telling me I was invested in tobacco? <laughs> okay, this is, this is problematic. And so I think they've realised that, right, it's time they made some decisions for that majority, that middle of your bell curve that you were talking about that aren't yeah. going to proactively come out and say, I really am passionate about human rights or animal welfare. Um, yeah. I think then beyond that, I think you're absolutely right. I think advisors need to find a way of just sort of finding a crack to open that door to just start that conversation in a gentle way. Um, I often say to advisors, you know, like your clients aren't coming into you, they're meeting with you and, and thinking, well, today I'm going to talk to you about my passion for animal rights, you know, like that's absolutely, not, but that doesn't mean that they absolutely would not want to be investing in a company that is doing animal testing of its products. Um, yeah. So I think you need to, in your discovery process or what a, Canadian last week said to me is your KYC, your know your client process is, is gently ask some of those questions. Like you said, you know, are there some areas you're really passionate about? Are there charities you do volunteer work for? Are there some, you know, issues that you support or through um, your charitable giving, for example, that you may not want to be supporting with your investments? Um, and I think it's really important just to open that discussion Uh, because we also know from our consumer research that about two thirds of Australians tell us they already expect that their financial advisor would be taking into account their ethical and values based preferences. Um, And so I I often say to advisors, Hey, for your next, you know, 20 client meetings, um, why don't you just ask that question and see whether, you know, your clients have an interest or areas they would not want to be invested in or um, because I think many advisors will say to us, well, not many of my clients ask the question. So I don't really think there's much of a demand there. And yeah. I would say, I would flip that on its head and say, well, that's a really risky position to take as your advisor because, you know, they may not ask the question, but they're not coming to you thinking they're going to chat about their passion project today. There, um, So I think joining the dots on behalf of your clients is really important. Um, I also feel like this is an area where a financial advisor can build a much deeper relationship with a client as well. It's like, wow, imagine doing that, managing their money in a way that helps protect their retirement and save for them in a really, really great way, but also manages to do that consistent with your client's absolute passions and strong values and convictions. Like this is a, this is an absolute win win from a client advisor relationship. And I think this is something that no algorithm or robo advice platform is ever going to be able to replicate that, you know? So I think this is a really great way to really um, work closely with your clients to help, help them sort of uh, both tick off both their investment outcomes, objectives and their values alignment objectives. Yeah. Well, I think the whole, the whole point of someone getting an advisor is actually a very uh, self centered in a good way. Like, because that's the, that is the value of advice is that most of the time we don't get to really focus on what it is that we want out of life sort of now, five years, 20 years, 50 years in the future. There's not a lot of time, you know, we're just sort of dealing with, mm-hmm. I've got to get this report done by 3 PM tomorrow. And so like advice is a really beautiful thing that's purchased and the result is, the, is, is sort of this unequivocal focus on the person who's purchased it. And, it, and that is like, there's nothing else like that in life. Like I, I'm, I'm so bullish on, it, on human interaction and human advice. And I think it's the best thing that mm-hmm. someone can buy. Um, and yet there is a conversation you just mentioned was these super funds aren't mentioning the divesting from cigarettes because they're going to sort of stir the nest. And I think that's a really 
really sort of insightful point in that because it's so focused on the individual as, as a good advisor, you don't actually want to distract from that. You don't, you don't want to bring it up. And, and, and it is true that when someone's really passionate about something, they can sort of mention it to you. And I totally respect that point of view. And, and um, I guess, I guess how to, how to get the most out of an ethical investment philosophy is probably just that really easy singular question of, you know, in your day to day life, are there things that you're skipping or avoiding or purposely using because of any kind of ethical sort of environment uh, or, or, or sorry, um, engagement. And then they can say yes or no. And I, and you're probably going to pick up a huge amount of people, right? So like, even before Woolworths got rid of plastic bags, it was, I guess a really sort of simple uh, question would have been, you know, do you, do you take a reusable bag when you go shopping just sort of in passing conversation? And I, mm. I don't think it needs to be like highly um, sort of focused on, but if, if they do sort of take the, take sort of the conversation and say, well, yeah, actually like I don't buy caged eggs or, or whatever it is. Mm. And it's like, okay, cool. So, you know, and you could probably go into a sort of a, a very quick conversation about this um, without taking up too much time. And I think, I think, you know, if someone's really passionate about it, they can sort of focus on it, but that's not the majority of people sort of 95% of people are going to not be hugely passionate about it. But I feel like if you could, if an advisor, cause a good advisor just asks good questions. Mm-hmm. And so if a good advisor just asks really briefly, really quickly, you know, and then allow the client themselves to take the conversation as deep as they want to take it. Then you're in a position where it's like you haven't forced anything on them. And then as long as you're sort of keeping it in the back of your mind that maximum sort of time I want to allocate this to this would be two to three, maybe five minutes, then get it sort of make sure we're back on track. But then I can sort of turn around in my recommendations and say, Hey, remember that conversation that we had? Um, I thought this would probably be pretty interesting for you. So in this allocation, we've avoided this, 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 you know, ha- like, does that fit for you? And they'll probably say yes. And I can tell you why advisors probably don't do that. They probably don't do that because they're scared of what the conversation, even that two to three minute conversation. Mm-hmm. So I went on your, on the website um, just prior to our conversation. We obviously spoke bef- before this podcast but you've got on the website a document for financial planners. So how big is it and what's it going to tell advisors? Because I feel like this is probably, and everyone's kind of been telling me this, this is probably like a really good first step just to handle a two to three minute conversation um, and take it from there. Totally. And I think what we're seeing is two things. One is that um, a lot of advisors are coming to us because they're getting clients asking those questions. Yeah. And secondly, a lot of advisors are feeling like they're not well equipped to respond to those questions. So it's like, oh, okay, I don't want to open that can of worms because I'm not sure how to respond to it. So so we we put together a guide for financial advisors to responsible investing. And what that does is really unpack, right, one, let's cut through the jargon because there's Mm. a whole lot of jargon in this field from ethical investing to impact investing, SRI, ESG, you know, the acronyms we've gone really overboard. Greenwashing. That was one of them. Greenwashing. Yeah, yeah, they're all there. So we kind of tried to say, well, let's just understand what each of them are and where they fit. Uh, Let's respond to some of the kind of deeply held suspicions about this area, such as you're going to pay a lot more and you're going to get bad performance if you're totally. in line Classic. with your ethics. So we can come back to that, but that's a really important one. And then it's about, let's just understand that there are a lot of resources out there to arm advisors with information now. And so we've kind of tried to articulate what some of those are. We even had like an example fact find for advisors, you know, how do you frame that question? We totally. talk about that in that guide. So I'd really encourage people to have a look at that. It's, it's a resource there for free for people to use. Um, yeah. Cause we want advisors to feel confident to have these conversations. We think it's a, it's a great asset in your practice and your service to be able to do it. Um, and we have sort of, you know, noticed that this is an issue. And so we kind of have tried to continue to build out what we have available for advisors to arm them with the right kind of answers and tools and information. And the 
great news is there's loads of information out there now. A lot of it's just free. There's information you can go to. There's, you know, even if you noticed recently you go to Yahoo Finance and at a stock by stock level, you look up an ASX ticker and it has sustainability data next to a particular company. So you can understand whether they've got good environmental practices or bad. And, yeah. and then, you know, you see all the rating some sort of funds from different fund rating agencies who now have their little green globes or their star ratings. Um, uh, so there's, there's sort of this plethora of information entering the market. And one of the things we do is, and it's responding really to your point about the greenwashing is because this has become such a big thing, this ethical investing, it's become sort of a bit of a, um, it's, it's really popular. We're seeing a rise in interest in it. So as a result, loads of fund managers and are bringing products to market. Mm. Um, and so one thing we've done that's really important is, is in the same way that, you know, organic produce have their little trademark logo that certifies it or free range eggs have certification or green power has certification or sweatshop free clothes. We've kind of done the same thing for investment products that are responsible or ethical funds. And wow. so they have to jump through a lot of hoops with us and give us all their information and data. And we audit what they're doing internally. And then when they get through that, we give them a little stamp and say, yep, you are actually delivering on what you're saying you're doing. Um, and so we have about 170 odd pro, uh, products now that are certified across, you know, all kinds of asset classes, uh, even banking products, super products, managed funds, ETFs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we put all of them up on a website called Responsible Returns. Um, and Responsible Returns is a nice little portal where you can sort of go to this great little search or function. Then as an advisor, you can go, right, well, I'm looking for a global equities product. What's there? Or I'm looking for something that excludes fossil fuels. What's there? And it kind of helps people to say, okay, actually today there are some really interesting products on the marketplace um, that fit different needs of different clients. So we're kind of trying to fill a bit of a gap to arm advisors to be ready to answer those questions because we, we want you to be engaging in those conversations and we think that, Today, compared to five years ago, there's a lot of products and answers and information and data and, in, you know, great information for advisors to be well armed and equipped to have that conversation. We think at least a much better conversation. He, here's a, a question. I don't want to put you on the spot. It's an economic question and I know you, uh, you've got a degree in it. So, <laughs> But um, do you have sort of any idea of funds under management growth in the last five years? Like is, is, is that sort of data that's available? Totally. So the, the industry's effectively tripled in the last five years. So we're now sitting at nearly half of all professionally managed assets in Australia um, are managed under responsible investment commitments. So that's about a trillion dollars of managed funds in Australia. Globally, we've kind of grown substantially to reach about 25% of all professionally managed funds globally have right. some commitment to responsible investing. Now, that's kind of the, that, they're the key words there, though, like some commitment to responsible investing. And so yeah. within that, there's a whole lot of different approaches. The biggest chunk of that, actually, what's really encouraged this strong uptake in such a short amount of time is, is what we talk about as sort of ESG investors and ESG is environmental, social and governance. And this is really a big chunk of the investment community that, that get and understand that these issues that we call the ESG, they're the kind of, they're the issues that don't tend to turn up in the financial statements of a company report. Um, they're the issues such as whether a company, well, you know, manages its internal culture and conduct or whether it actually, you know, has tailings dams that collapse or whether it underpays its wages or whether it, you know, pollutes the environment. These are all issues that we know today actually drive share market performance and company valuations. And mm. um, the challenge is that these aren't the things in the, in the financial statements. So to really understand a stock and choose a stock and invest in it, you need to understand a whole lot of broader context than just what's in the P&L. Um, oh, yeah. And so this is sort of the ESG, and this is a big chunk of that whole market uptake. And it's actually not about ethics at all. It's just about good investment practice. Um, and really we've got a majority of the market now in Australia who just understand that for me to deliver good investment outcomes, I need to understand all this sustainability stuff that traditionally would have been deemed non-financial but today we know it's so financial and it's so core to what's moving markets um a much smaller portion of that well trillion dollars in australia is what we'd call our ethical investment so that is investors who are really investing in alignment with values or, or 
targeting more sustainable companies or trying to do impact investments. And so although it's a smaller part, it's really grown quite exponentially in the last five years. Yeah. Um, we had a bit of a goal to grow that really fast. So we kind of work really hard to promote it and build awareness. And, and really in the last three years, it's gone from about two and a half percent of the market to 12% of the market in about three years. So 12, become, 12% yeah, so percent of the market jumped in that amount of time, proportionally sort of times four in three years or so. And that's really about consumers Whoa. starting to go, Hey, I didn't know I could actually ask for my super fund to be invested in really cool stuff and, and avoiding really harmful stuff. That's, so that's, that's, that is a huge, huge growth. Yeah. What, yeah. 4% to 12% of the market in a handful of years. Yep, that's right. It's exciting. And I think this is kind of snowballing because awareness is building. Um, more and more Australians are asking for it and asking questions of their super funds and their advisors and their banks. And it's sort of self-perpetuating now where we can expect this to continue. And the other thing that's really leading is we've got kind of 20 or so NGOs out there in Australia who are telling their client, their members to hassle their banks and their super funds and to divest of fossil fuels and to invest in this and avoid live animal export. And so you've got this whole constituency in Australia being armed to direct their interest and campaigns to the finance sector. And so that's only going to continue to accelerate it. Yeah, there is, um, there's an ethical, I think I'm pretty sure it's just called ethical super. They've been around since I believe the late eighties or something like that. And they've been around for a long, long time. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure there's been a, a massive uptick in, um, in their, in, in their membership recently. Absolutely. So that's a fund that, you know, was a very small niche fund, Australian ethical, um, and has really swelled to become quite a significant size fund. Yeah. Um, and I think they just do a really good job of talking to Australians about the issues they care about, you know, um, as opposed to starting the conversation from, the perspective of issues that many of us find quite mundane, um, such as risk return profiles and, you know, um, and <laughs> default products. And, um, uh, and, and they, they use that as a gateway to get people engaged with their money and their finance. And I think that's great. And, and we're seeing a significant enough group of new funds, super funds, fund managers enter the market with really cool products that do great things. Um, and they're starting to take up market share, you know, and it's starting to sort of, I call them the punks and upstarts because they're kind of the, they're the new guys on the block, you know, but um, they're getting enough traction because a lot of people care about this and mm. a lot of people want their finance investments, their, their investments to be aligned with, you know, doing some good in the world. And so this is having, uh, has become big enough that it's really having an impact on the big guys too. So the big funds out there are having to respond and either bringing out new products or strengthening their products or talking more about their position on climate change or human rights or gender on company boards or all of these issues. And I think it's, it's having a big impact that's reverberating across the financial services sector. Yeah. It's um, I mean, something, something with 400% growth, just sort of tells you that this is it's it's no longer a background noise it's and i guess that's why we're doing a um a series on it um what it, we you mentioned before how when these funds come to market i think you mentioned something around 120 of them um how many of them get through your audit and how oh, many good of question. them, how yeah. many, how many have failed the audit? I guess. Yeah, yeah. So we have about 170 products certified and what um, happens is a lot of them come to us and put their product forward and say, I want to get certified. And we go, that product's not good enough to be certified. Right. Um, what you'll need to do is go back and actually have really good processes in place and really be clear on articulating what you're doing and not doing. And you're going to need to update your PDS or your information memorandum and come back to us when that's done and we'll look at it again. And right. what's really interesting to us is that, yes, there are some that just go away and never come back again. But more frequently, um, these fund managers actually seen that there's value in doing this well and so often 
do all those actions that we've requested of them, go and update things and take it to their general counsel to update their PDS and put in place better processes and start disclosing their portfolio holdings, which we require as part of the program, um, and come back to us and it's like, oh, right, it may have taken six months or sometimes 12 months to get certified, but they will go through that process and start strengthening it. So we kind of like that because it means we're effectively having an impact of strengthening the practices of responsible and ethical investing in the marketplace and saying, right, the bar's here. So if you want to get that little stamp of approval, you're going to need to get up to that level. So, um, so we certainly have some that are either don't make it or that are kicked off the program because they haven't, maintained the standards that are required right um we of course as you'd imagine we don't name them oh no bit. of course not <laughs> but um but it's you know and i think what what happens more and more is that like five years ago it was probably okay to call yourself an ethical fund and have in place a couple of negative screens and that was it where today you know i think the consumer expectation of that has grown and certainly industry practices have grown and Today, yeah, it's important that you, if you're an ethical fund, you'd have those negative screens in place. Mm. But equally, I think what's become more and more important is how those fund managers actually effectively try to influence corporate behaviour through their voting practices, through their engagement practices, right. and really ensuring they're actually becoming what we call sort of active owners and stewards of those investments. So, so what about an ETF mode. then? Yeah, well, that's that's because an ETF mis- is, I guess, specifically not active. So it's it's an algorithm that sort of trades um is that is is it capable is is it an option for an etf then to be ethical because obviously an etf is not going to make a, a vote well the etfs can still vote they're still owners of shares so they should still be voting and we'd expect that um sure uh but uh, you're right i mean it's a it's a passive natured fund so they're not going to be out there actively engaging with every stock they own yeah um, it's interesting some of the governance structures in place are quite good with some of these etfs so they might have a sustainability advisory committee that helps them to stay on top of issues, for example. And so you'll see some ETFs will add another exclusion in place because a particular issue that wasn't an ethical issue has become an ethical issue. So that's happened in some occasions. Equally, we actually are requiring ETFs to still actively, um, uh, well, still to ensure they're voting and in some cases engaging with companies as well. So you'll see that, um, The the interesting thing going on in that growth of passive investments is that you have some very, very large fund managers around the world who are investing passively and and they'll actually say to you, well, it's almost more important that I use my vote thoughtfully and that I engage with companies because I don't have the choice to divest of this company. So actually my future performance is tied with the success of this company. So the big Black Rocks and Vanguards of the world, they'll tell you, well, actually we're quite active and proactive in this space because we're going to own this company come hell or high water for a long time. And so we want it to succeed. Um, So we kind of make sure we maintain that kind of focus on ensuring they're delivering on that as well. But it's, um, but yeah, it's, it's a tricky one in that sense. No, but I, okay. That totally makes sense. Yeah. So I guess I was extending the active or passive investment philosophy to, I just assumed how active or passive they were with their voting as well. But I mean, what you've said makes a lot of sense. If something's, you know, number 80 in the S&P 500, then, uh, yeah, it's probably going to be there for a while. So yep. they, they're never going to get out. They're stuck there, essentially. So, uh, so may as well make that vote worthwhile. That does, that really does make a lot of sense. So the big guys are really sort of, you know, flexing their muscles and pushing their weight around and this stuff. And, you you know, you're you're seeing they, you know, will own big chunks of companies. So they're in there actually having meetings at at a board level and saying, well, we're not happy with how well you're preparing yourself for the Paris Agreement, you know, net zero emissions by 2050. We want to see your plan. How are you going to operate under the lower, lower emissions pathway? And, you know, actually we've got a modern slavery bill in Australia now. So how are you maintaining that your supply chain is not using slavery practices in some way, shape or form, because that'll end up in a policy uh, and fines for your company. So we kind of see them being quite active in terms of how they're engaging with companies and trying to influence corporate behavior in that way. Interesting. Um, I'll ask somewhat of an interesting uh, question, um, which is who decides what's ethical? So the, the, the Paris agreement, for example, you know, like there's a part of me that goes, well, the requirement f- for China and India wasn't there. 
Um, so, and, and being the biggest polluters, you know, and we're, and we're not putting sort of any pressure on them um, is, you know, and I, I kind of sound like I've probably on, maybe I looked at this a bit too much, but I always thought that it was overly soft on arguably the biggest contributors to pollution. So I, I kind of looked at it and went, well, why is, why, why is that the, why are we agreeing to that? You know, it's kind of hilarious that my wife is from Finland and in Finland, they, they've got four, four million people, four million people, right? And they, they talk about not eating uh, meat and uh, milk and, um, you know, that, like their focus on the environment is so high mm. and yet they have absolutely zero impacts, <laughs> absolutely zero impact on, uh, on the environment as a whole. Um, so I always go like who, who decides what ethical is? Is it ethical to back the Paris accord because there was improvement, even if it wasn't everything we wanted or, or is there people out there saying, actually, you know, that doesn't, that's not enough. We need more. Yeah, it's good. When we talk about ethical investing, you know, the, the criticism you often hear is, well, whose ethics, who the ethics are you choosing? And, right. Yeah. Um, and you know, everyone's ethics aren't the same. And so I think to some extent, yes, that's true. I, I always think that to a large extent, though, you know, the fact that 195 countries have signed up to an Ottawa convention against cluster munitions and landmines and that you've got conventions internationally on labour rights and you've got agreements at an international level where you've got all these countries have signed up and agreed to them. I would think that's a pretty safe universal baseline for a starting point on those industries that we could pretty safely and uncontroversially say, yep, it's not a good idea to use child labour. You know, that's, that's, that's more a norms than, a, than an ethics in a sense. It's like it's a societal expectation um, that that would be the case. And so I think the starting point there is there's a lot of safe space for us in ethical investing. You know, a lot of non-controversial decisions that we can make to say that's just should be out of portfolios. You know, um, oh, yeah. there might be a few people who want to get overexposed to child labor and he heavily weighted in that area. And that's fine. They can go and find a, a vice fund and tilt towards those stocks, you know, and they exist just so you know, no um, way. But, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, there are vice funds out there. Um, but for the most part, that's non-controversial. I think you're right though. Then there's all these other issues that people are going to feel passionate and going to have different views on how they play out. And so I think from my perspective, I think, well, that's why we have a lot of different products in a marketplace who sure. each can compete for that segment of the market that are all about fossil fuels and climate change and Paris Agreement or that part of the market who are all about human rights um, or animal welfare. And so, you know, there's a vegan super fund out there. Fantastic. There'll wow. be, you know, vegans who want a vegan super fund. Unreal. You know, it's yeah. not what I need, but it's what someone yeah. else needs. And so yeah. we kind of say, well, that, that diversity of product offerings is great. Um, and no, it's not our job as the finance sector to go and make big judgment calls about the ethical values of Australians. That's not what we're employed for. It's not what advisors are employed for. Quite frankly, you'd have to argue the finance sector is probably not well placed to be making those kind of judgments right now, um, to be frank. But, um, but I think there's safe territory for us that's sort of irrefutable kind of ethical values that are quite universal I yeah. think we start there in that safe space yeah. and then sure we can have big discussions around the value or not of the Paris agreement and emissions reduction strategies. And the, it's kind of the, the tactics we take and the responses we take in terms of responding to that. And that, and that's kind of when we get down to discussions about right fossil fuel divestment. Okay. Does that mean you just exclude coal mining companies or is mm. it, coal electric producing companies or is it oil and gas companies mm. is it metallurgical uh, coal i.e that stuff that makes yeah. steel which is very hard to substitute for yeah. um, is it the train providers that transport the coal from the mines to the ports is it the ships is it the bankers who finance you know totally so, so for us we look at fossil fuel divestment and say well you know of the products we have certified there's probably 30 that have fossil fuel screens in place there's probably 20 different definitions of what that fossil fuel screen is. And so um, from our perspective, as long as these companies are not misleading their clients and have been really clear as to where they draw the line, then that's probably okay. That said, I think we need to, you know, have the bar sufficiently high here, but, um, 
but yeah, I think I think it's really really important that the finance sector is very clear on what they're doing and not doing from an ethical perspective. Um, so for a long time, we've had a bit of ambiguity sometimes in some of these exclusions. They might say we exclude uranium where it only contributes, you know, over 20% of the revenue of a company. Um, and so, right. you know, you've got a big miner like a BHP, for example, where they have one of the world's biggest uranium mines um, at Roxby Downs, but it only contributes in BHP's massive amounts of revenue. It only contributes about 5 to 10% of their revenues. Right. And so that can get a bit too smart sometimes those revenue thresholds. And we need to be a bit careful that that's you know, actually someone who wants to avoid uranium probably wants to avoid the world's biggest uranium mine, <laughs> even if it is only a small portion of the company's total revenue. So, yeah. so I think things like that, we really look closely at in our certification program that we would probably consider that are uh, erring on a bit misleading or at least confusing for a customer. Um, yeah. So if, that's how we kind of avoid some of the ethical quagmire without yeah. just throwing our hands up saying it's all too hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, as the advisor really just has to be essentially at, at least one step ahead of the client base. So I don't think, you know, you, again, you're, you're going to have people who are really interested, but the majority of people are just going to want to hear something along the lines of we, we made sure there was no child labor. And, and then, and, you know, there was a, uh, we, we took out the things that are causing a lot of hell on earth weapons. Um, so yeah, it's, it, I, I, I'm sure if someone's, I don't, you, you're not going to get too many, uh, too, too many people complaining about stuff like that, but um, it's, it, is there any sort of detail that now we've already spoken about advisors sort of uh, jumping on the website and we'll make sure we put a link in the description, but um can can advisors sort of reach out to you or your company and and uh what you know why would they reach out to you and your company just for advisors that are looking to they put up their hand they go right i'm happy to want to facilitate a five minute conversation or want to be able to hold my own what's their best next step yeah yeah i mean so you know a key part of what we do is provide this information to keep our members including financial advisors up to speed on these issues right. and how, how you might respond to them <clears throat> so we're constantly providing information running webinars events etc for advisors and fund managers and super funds in our membership to keep them right up to speed up to speed on this stuff i mean um we have a lot of advisor members and wealth management firm members um, because they want to understand, they want to be keeping up to speed, they want the best information. We're, interestingly, we also certify financial advisors as specialist ethical financial advisors because right. we see a lot in the community who increasingly want to sort of differentiate themselves to be really good at this stuff. Interesting. And yep. to do that, we require that they, you know, have adequate good products on their approved product list that in their fact finding process that they are asking all of their clients about their preferences yeah. and that they actually have to tell us about some case studies as to how they would do sort of a portfolio perspective in ethical and responsible investing. So that then allows them to sort of differentiate themselves and say, Hey, I'm, I'm not only do I know how to do this, but I'm a bit of a specialist in this area. Mm. So then we kind of do the, you know, CPD points for attending different events and working groups. Um, we also have a neat little sort of find an advisor tool on our website. So we find advisors get a bit of flow through of traffic and, and clients through that because we're, we're receiving a lot of those inquiries from clients ourselves saying, you know, where, where do I go? My advice, the common question to us is I told my advisor, I'm really passionate about climate change or I wanted to avoid something. And he said, well, leave that to your philanthropy. I'm managing your investments, you know. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of say, well, actually, there's probably, there's probably advisors out there who can do a better job than that. So let's, you know, let, let us help you kind of find them. Right, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, our job is to keep our members right up to speed on this information, uh, let them know what products are coming through as certified, give them briefings on some of the products. And so, yeah, coming to us is a great way to keep yourself really well informed of this. Um, we also do have a training course in ESG and responsible investing right. where it's in sort of an online course that people can do to just get up to speed as to what are we talking about? Why are we talking about it? What does it mean? But I think the starting point is really having a look at our advisor guide on responsible investing, which is just a nice little document that will keep you get that foundational level understanding ready to go. Um, I think one of the main 
things that we often have found we need to contend with is this perception about performance of funds. Um, because we constantly get this sense that, oh, they're going to underperform. If we're excluding part of our universe, that necessarily means that we've got a smaller universe, which necessarily means that there's less chance to kind of play with that universe to seek good performance. And I, you know, I think it's always really important just to note that that has been thoroughly debunked right. in mountains of like empirical research out of esteemed institutions like Harvard and Oxford and um, who now conclude actually that considering these issues can really enhance your investment outcomes just and it's basically based on the premise that the companies we're investing in that consider sustainability issues and the ESG issues these are the companies that are thinking long-term that are really building businesses with a strategy that's long-term to avoid those big risks of, you know, the fines from governments or the policy changes that restrict their ability to operate. So these tend to be the companies that are performing really well over the long term. And so, um, so in that same guide, we cite a lot of studies that kind of underpin this, that we're seeing really good performance and outperformance from responsible and ethical funds against their mainstream counterparts and against the benchmark. So I think that's a really key kind of fact for advisors when they're thinking about this too, that the, the myth of underperformance has well and truly been debunked. Cool. Oh, well, mate, thanks so much for your time. Um, Simon, it's been amazing to have you on the podcast. Um, yeah, is there, is there anything else that you'd like to leave us with? Because we covered quite a lot of territory. I just, you know, the thing I often say to advisors is um, there is a risk in not thinking about this and not dealing with this with your clients. You know, as much as it's a nice to have, I think increasingly when we know that two thirds of Australians are expecting their advisor to already be considering this stuff. Um, and, you know, polling is one thing. We take it all with a grain of salt. You know, polling can tell you all kinds of interesting things. Totally. I'll tell you the case study that best exemplifies this to me was about three years ago in New Zealand where a very savvy journalist did an expose on the, on the Kiwi Saver funds, the superannuation funds of New Zealand. And on the front page of the NZ Herald produced exactly the exposure of these funds to nuclear weapons, to tobacco, to cluster munitions and landmines. And there was a public outcry you know and, and generally prior to august 2016 most advisors would say there's not a lot of interest in new zealand for this stuff post august 2016 you found nearly every single fund manager over there has in place exclusions ethical wow. investment policies the works because it demonstrated immediately that that it kind of we risk failing the pub test you know if you kind of go down the pub and you say well are you happy having british american tobacco in your kiwi saver fund or your super fund and New Zealand's resoundingly said, no, absolutely not. Like that's, that's abhorrent to me. And so I think there's a risk in Australia that we see the same. Um, we're protected by the fact that portfolio holdings generally aren't kind of being disclosed in Australia, mm. um, which is pretty worrying in itself. Um, so I would just, you know, encourage people to be proactive on this. And I've seen so much upside for advisors to engage their clients on these conversations and really have a really deep, valuable relationship with their client being able to sort of marry both good investment outcomes and, and aligning with their values. That's, that's just an awesome proposition to be able to offer. Fantastic. Well, again, thanks so much for your time. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers.